I am 41 presently, in the way time is counted for these bodies, but I have almost always, that I can remember, felt like an old man. I have always been somehow nostalgic, nostalgic for something or some place I have never been, or that I have no memory of, which already shows some memory of it. My present character's life started among two others. My father was a good man in my view, hard-working and helpful, but he had this insecurity always lingering within him that fed on the memory of a hatred for what was done to him in childhood. It would always come to the fore whenever certain triggers were pulled so that he too sought refuge and would find it in the work he so much loved to do. He had been the son of a single mother at a time and setting when a woman getting pregnant unmarried was a huge social stigma. Even worse, the father fled and so wasn't there to be forced to marry as was custom in these cases. So his mother, my late grandmother, the only one I met, left him in the Casapia, a sort of orphanage even for children who had parents but were in a poor position. He had to fight his way through bullying, standing his ground among the hardened orphans, which built his character, by the way, and fend off hard times in any way possible. My mother? She was robbed of herself early on and given a personality to be for the rest of her life, to which the world added to over the years. She was shrewd, clever, and a survivor in mentality, so her moral viewpoint was based upon advantage gain. If some advantage was gained in the material or social life, whatever were the means employed, then it meant a blessing. If some disadvantage occurred, then it was a curse. There was no hint of any kind of rebellion against the realm, merely an unwavering adapting mentality to whatever worked to be comfortable in it. At one time, it worked to have this viewpoint or to do something. That is what she would think or do. At another, it would work to have a different opinion or to do the opposite. She would just do it without any other consideration apart from maximizing advantage. Both thought they were just what they were. And how could they ever think otherwise? They did not benefit from the times we inherited. When the more things turn murkier, the more clear they seem. Through a tool such as we are using now, where we can share notes sh such as these. Where I, as a shadow, am now, I owe to them. Not despite of what they were themselves in their roles, but because they were so. They were very different individuals, but I was written in, so to speak amidst their difference, their contrast, and it was through them and the induction their personalities provided that my ego-based personalities were formed, for better or worse. They were, at the start of my present character, the first shadows I paid with my own life to write the beginning, the intro to my present story. You see, our shadows asked for a world where they can be just shadows, where they don't have to confront their nature, look internally, be shocked and face that discomfort that is always there. So we pay demons continuously to deceive us and trap us willingly, to avoid facing the fact that we fell from heaven, so to speak, and we won't be getting there amidst the shame and the lies we tell ourselves to avoid facing that same shame. Whenever someone comes up and tries to write something different, something that would upset what the shadows in us really want, which is the avoidance, then we attack that individual, because he is indeed a threat in that sense. How many have we met who were crazies at first, only to, later on as we shifted, turn into wise ones? And what about the script aide, whom we thought wise, and afterwards we find him to be the crazy one? 
The world is upside down because we are upside down, like the hanged man tarot card. Hanged upside down so that we can see into our own inner shadow world reflected back at us as if it was straight. I mean, just imagine this. If suddenly our soul, shadow and self, was in the presence of truth, not the demon of the realm, but the absolute truth, wouldn't we feel shame? Even us who have taken the opportunity and searched and realized? We would. But that shame we would have to endure, like being there naked with everything known, every thought, every stupidity, every little secret. This is the reason for the powering of demons and why, when those who do submit to the shame through the trust in truth that cannot be seen, eventually reconnect, leave the movie, and the movie shrinks in power, scope, and quality. And the value of accepting and admitting one's shame, which is usually protected by pride, so that we avoid looking in that mirror like vampires who can't see themselves, that value I learned from observing my old dog Boo that we rescued from a dog pound almost two years ago, as I've mentioned previously. I learned from observing her shame when sometimes she wakes up from her sleep and she has leaked some pee. Now she only has incontinence when she sleeps, and only sometimes, so she sleeps with a diaper at night, but not always so during her naps in the afternoon. Before, when we rescued her, just by sitting down she would leak, so she is much better presently, but it will never truly be fixed. This is apparently usually caused by the neutering mutilating surgery they do on dogs, by the way, under the pretense of goodwill. Anyway, at first she doesn't want to get up when she detects she has peed in her sleep without a diaper. Then she gets up when we are not looking, and in her shame she tries to cover it, either with something like a blanket or even her own body, trying to pretend it didn't happen, like it would dry quicker if she does this and cover it somehow. All of this so that she does not confront the shame, because she knows it shouldn't have happened, but she doesn't understand that we know perfectly well it's not her fault or intention, that she can't control her faulty body when she's asleep in the same manner that we can control our shadow selves during our own sleep when we also have incontinence of sin and stupidity and leave a trail of mess behind us. So we call this coming to awareness, waking up, which means or should mean trying to know our faults, to accept the shame and putting down the pride that tries to hide it, in the trust and knowledge that truth loves us regardless, because truth knows what we are. So that shame-facing and pride-dropping are part of doing that which I had previously also realized is one of the hardest things in this realm, to allow ourselves to be loved despite the shame for the faults and the pride that tries to hide them. It is not by further victimizing an already thoroughly victimized ego that this is achieved. Judge not, lest you be judged. <laughs> by whom? Not by truth. No judgment there, only a thorough knowing of ourselves. And love. But by our own shame. A shame that holds us down in demonic territory. Like I wrote in one of the comments ex exchanges with Robert Not Son of Divided, for which I am grateful, our shadows build walls around them, yes, Pink Floyd's work comes to mind allegorically, that are usually held by a fragile pin, a single block that is the foundation that sustains the entire dam. Removing that pin, like realizing that single issue or trigger within us, Understanding not just rationally or academically, but fully, empirically, if you like, what we are and what we pay to write for us, the script that surrounds our reality bubble, removing that one piece 
will trigger a cascade effect that will eventually crumble the entire wall, leaving the shadow exposed. How does the shadow deal with it? Facing the shame of its luggage, bereft of the pride that hid it, face to face with the love that the shadow has trouble accepting is meant for itself. Will it allow to be loved and trusted? Or will it break down, flee and build a new wall? I am one just like you, no different, with the shame that I face and the pride that I see crumbling. And we really are among each other, perhaps among those who are, metaphorically speaking, cancelling their subscription to the scriptwriter.